Welcome in, everybody, episode 596 of the podcast in Assuming America, the Intro Sports Podcast. It is Friday, September 30th, 2022, people. I hope everybody's doing well. I hope everybody is having a great day. I hope everybody is ready for a loaded Friday episode of the Aaron Torres Sports Podcast. Here is what you need to know about today's show. We're going to open week five, college football. Two big picture conversations before we get to the previews. First, Auburn LSU. Simple question. If Auburn does not win this week, does Brian Harson survive? Got to be honest. I think he probably doesn't survive the weekend. We'll discuss that from there. Alabama, Arkansas. We talked about it on Wednesday's show. Nick Saban wants hateful competitors at Alabama. If you're if you have hateful competitors, if you have mean dudes, go out and show it against Arkansas. Plus, we preview the rest of the week five slate. We talk all sorts of good games. Michigan, Iowa. We talk who else? NC State, Clemson, Kentucky, Ole Miss. Really fun show. Really exciting show. And we'll of course wrap with where Aaron was right, where Aaron was wrong, our Friday staple. Again, like I said, just a really, really, really fun show. Before we get started, I do want to remind everybody, first of all, I want to thank, point blank, I want to thank our presenting sponsor, Betfred Sportsbook and the Betfred Sportsbook app. Here's the deal. Nobody takes care of their customers quite like Betfred. Cannot uh, tell you how much I love working with these guys and girls. Okay, so here is the deal. I've told you many times, started in 1967 in the UK. They are one of the most respected sports books and sports, you know, sports gambling companies in Europe. They have come to the United States and made a splash. Not only the presenting sponsor of the Aaron Torres podcast, Aaron Torres Media, but also the Denver Broncos, the Colorado Rockies and the Cincinnati Bengals. They gave away a bunch of tickets to that Cincinnati Bengals Thursday night game against the Miami Dolphins. Congratulations to all of those winners of Bengals tickets against the Dolphins. I should mention, by the way, this is what they do. They take care of their customers. Nobody does more for the people that support them than Betfred Sportsbook. Uh, Again, I've told you, bar crawls for Arizona Cardinals games in Arizona. Rockies games, Betfred bettors have thrown out the first pitch. Of course, the Denver Broncos tailgates before the games. So nobody does more for their customers than Betfred. Two quick things. One, you just want to bet on college football this weekend. No better offer than what Betfred has going. Bet 50, get to 50 in free bets, courtesy of the Betfred Sportsbook. Unbelievable. On top of that, we have the AT Betfred boost for the third week in a row. Two weeks ago, it was Washington minus three and a half. It cashed with ease. Not going to talk about last week when I had North Carolina minus one and a half. But this week, Iowa at home. Plus 11. I know some of you, I can't bet on Iowa. Their offense stinks. I'm telling you, I'm going to explain why later in the show that that is the bet for you. Boosted odds to plus 110. It will be in the sports book on Friday morning. Thank you to Bedfred, our presenting sponsor. So excited to be working with them. And really quickly, I always tell you, Bracket Fanatics, BracketFanatics.com. They are hosting our NFL Pick'em Challenge every single week. Every week, a new user gets a hundred dollars. Well, this is what we're doing: eighteen weeks, eighteen hundred dollar winners, cash prize. If you go ahead and sign up for the Aaron Torres NFL Pick'em Challenge, BracketFanatics.com. We worked with them during March Madness. We are working with them again. As I said, every single week, hundred dollar cash prize for a winner. Just pick games, win loss. That's it. And then on top of that, we have a thousand dollar season-long cash prize, BracketFanatics.com. Go there, join Bracket Torres. Tell them Torres sent you, BracketFanatics.com. Excited to be working with them as well. But with that said, let's get to the topic of the day. And the topic of the day, I'll just tell you, this feels like the weekend that like, okay, college football, it's officially back. It is officially go time. There are so many good games across the slate in college football that I'm fired up to watch. Alabama, Arkansas, Kentucky, Ole Miss, Michigan, Iowa, NC State, Clemson, Wake Forest, Florida State, I think is going to be a really good one. But where I want to start is with a game that I don't know if it's technically off the radar. It's a great SEC rivalry, but it's a game that isn't getting a lot of pub. Neither team is ranked, and it is LSU and Auburn. And what I don't want to do is sit here and break down the game. And if Auburn's run defense does this against LSU's this, and what about LSU here? And that's not what I want to do. 
But instead, I want to kind of talk about it in the existential big picture, if you will. I was asked a question earlier in the week in a radio interview. I thought it was a great question. And that this is how I kind of want to frame the conversation on Auburn. The question, if Auburn loses this game, is this the end of the Brian Harson era at Auburn? In other words, is this win or go home literally for Brian Harson? And while I don't think anybody knows, I saw there was a report by A.J. McCarron that he's already been fired. Nothing is confirmed. I'm not saying it, it, it did happen. I'm not saying it will happen. But should it happen? I'll be honest. I do think if Auburn loses, and I do think if it gets ugly on Saturday night in the Plains at home against an unranked LSU team, then yeah, I do think Brian Harson probably will be out as early as Sunday. And I'll be honest, I've switched my opinion on all this. I think it's probably for the best that they go ahead and do it, that Auburn goes ahead and makes the move. And I think some of you that aren't Auburn fans probably sitting back and saying, Torres, what are you talking about? It's only year two for Brian Harson, And this guy is three and one right now this season going into the LSU game this weekend. But what I would say is a couple of things. One, what do I say all the time on this show? There are lies, there are damn lies, and there are statistics, okay? And the statistic that you see on that paper that says three and one is not reflective of who Auburn has been. First of all, the one loss, absolutely abysmal. We all watched the game. It was against Penn State. It was a big CBS game Saturday afternoon. The Auburn crowd is there. The Auburn crowd is fired up. And Penn State just absolutely punked Auburn in that game. The final score was 41-12. to But what was so jarring about that game was that in a matchup of by far the best team that they've played all year at home, Auburn just looked completely overwhelmed and overmatched by what is probably realistically the third or fourth best team in the Big Ten. Penn State finished that game. Obviously, 41 to 12 was the final score, but they ran all over Penn State or they ran all over Auburn to the tune of like six and a half yards per carry. You had Penn State fans telling me that it was the most dominant win against a pseudo legitimate opponent of the James Franklin era. So you have that bad loss on your resume. But even the three wins aren't all that impressive, okay? Now, you open against Mercer, FCS team, whatever. Week two, you play San Jose State. Not sure how many of you watched that. I think it was on SEC+++. Not even on SEC+. They didn't want to put it on SEC+, let alone the SEC network, let alone ESPN or ESPN2. 24-18 to was the final score against the San Jose State team that frankly just isn't very good. It wasn't like, oh, San Jose State played the game of their lives and, you know, Auburn was, you know, was just on the wrong side of that. San Jose State is not a very good football team and not a very good football conference in the Mountain West. And then, of course, we also know what happened last week against Missouri. Back at home, off that loss to Penn State, and it was really ugly in that Missouri game. It, they, they did win the game, but we all saw how it went down. The final score was 17-14. to 14. Auburn finished the game with 217 yards of offense against what was the SEC's, basically their worst defense last year. Um, And more importantly, we all know that Auburn probably should have lost that game not once, but at least twice. Missouri missed a field goal as time expired. And also, they fumbled on the one-yard line going in for the game-winning score in overtime. So the fact that Auburn is even 3-1 and right now The fact that Auburn is even three and one right now is kind of a minor miracle. And I think the only stat you need to know against FBS opponents this year, Auburn has actually been outscored through three games. And so you look at this team, you look at this program, and you look at the conversation as to why Brian Harson could potentially be fired if they were to lose this game and to lose it bad. I just, there's, there's a couple of reasons why one, There's just no juice in this program, right? I mean, there's no pride in this program. The fact that you had, and listen, you can criticize Auburn fans for this, that, the other thing. I've said it many times. I don't love how they handled things last winter with Brian Harson. But the one thing you can't deny, they showed up in a big way for that Penn State game, and the team on the field did not show up for them. So it was bad enough, great environment, great atmosphere, Uh, My buddy, Matt, who runs the Torres on Auburn account, was at the game. He said it was as lively as any Auburn game he's been to in a very long time. So the fans showed up. After the offseason, the fans supported Brian Harson and this team in the first big game. They completely had a no-show. And then on top of that, to come back a week later against a bad Missouri team, and I know it was an 11 a.m. Central time kickoff, but to have no fire, no energy, no passion in another home game that's just really bad 
And so if you lose to LSU on Saturday, you are now looking at three and two in what was supposed to be the easy part of the schedule. Listen, I said it at the beginning of the segment. I didn't think Brian Harson should be let go last year. I thought he should have the offseason to get things corrected. But this was supposed to be the easy part of the schedule. And I'll take it a step further. This was supposed to be the, 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 the moment where you build momentum for when things get tough. This wasn't supposed to be the tough part. This was supposed to be the part where things are easy to build for when it gets tough. Five straight home games to start the year. If you're three and two, what hope do you have for the rest of the season? Look at Auburn's schedule from here. After this week, they play at Georgia. After this week, they play at Ole Miss after Georgia. So the next two games, at Georgia, at Ole Miss, two teams currently ranked in the top 15. Then from there, you get a bye. You know who you play after that? Arkansas, ranked in the top 20. After that, you know who you play? Mississippi State, who beat you last year. Then you still have Texas A&M at home, and you still have Alabama on the road. So after this week, you have seven games left. Five are against ranked opponents. One of the five that is not against a ranked opponent is a team that beat you last year at home in Mississippi State. And so if you can't get through this stretch three and two, there's no reason to think you can turn it around. And what I would say is, like I just said a minute ago, there's no juice in the program. There's no reason to really believe that things will get fixed with more time. It's certainly not going to get fixed against Georgia. It's not going to get fixed against Ole Miss. It's not going to get fixed against Arkansas. And I look at this team and I look at this program and a few things stand out. Um, you know, one, I don't even know if Brian Harson wants this job anymore. Two, I would think that if you get another lifeless effort on a Saturday night at home against an SEC West rival, I don't see the reason to, to stick by Brian Harson and the reason to believe that not only can he figure it out, but that you should give him more time to figure it out. It's really interesting. I think back to when Scott Frost was let go at Auburn or at Auburn, at Nebraska, at Nebraska. He never coached at Auburn. I know at Nebraska. And the AD Trev Albert said, you know, I think these kids just need a new voice. And I do wonder after watching Brian Harson on the sidelines the last two weeks, after watching him in a press conference the last two weeks, I do wonder if maybe Auburn just needs a new voice in that locker room. And to be clear, I have not always been in this camp. This is something I will say. The more that I cover college football, the more that I'm around it, the more that I see this up close and in person, how the sausage gets made, if you will. I used to think, give a guy the extra year, give him two years, give him three, you know, you need at least three, four years. I don't believe it is that way anymore. And not only do I not believe it's that way, I believe that it's almost a hindrance to keep people around. First of all, we know how this whole thing works. You now have to fire coaches earlier in the season so you can get the next guy in place for the recruiting cycle, right? That's what USC did last year. They ended up with Lincoln Riley. That's what LSU did last year. They ended up with Brian Kelly. That's what Nebraska, Arizona State, and Georgia Tech did. So one, you just have to do it to get the next guy in place to get going for the recruiting periods in December and February. But then two, money is no longer an issue. And three, this whole thing can be flipped really quick. And I do think it's interesting that if LSU ends up being Brian Harson's last stand, it's kind of interesting to me because LSU is the perfect example of, and I'm not saying Brian Kelly's the right guy. I'm not saying he's fixed everything, but they're three and one. They've looked really good the last three weeks, and they're starting to play like a good football team. Brian Kelly came in, hit the transfer portal hard, recruited as well as he could in that class. Now, he didn't have a great recruiting class in 2022, but he's already got a jump start on 2023, top six, top seven class, and he was really aggressive in the portal, and now the guys that he got in the portal are having success. Jaden Daniels, the quarterback, Noah Kane, the running back. Um, there's a few guys on the offensive line that are playing well. There's a few guys on the defense that are playing well. But to me, I used to be that guy, give it time, take a deep breath, everybody relax, it's going to be fine. But when you're Brian Harson, you haven't really, you know, one, I don't even know that you want to be there. Two, it doesn't feel like the players are playing hard to keep your job. You've never shown an ability to recruit at the highest level. I am with Auburn fans that feel like, look, if this weekend is the game, if this weekend is the one that it gets out of hand, I would have no fundamental issue if Brian Harson is let go at Auburn this Saturday. By the way, it just struck me. I did not make an official Bet Fred pick uh, for this game. LSU is actually an eight-point road favorite. The over-under is about 45 and a half in the Bet Fred Sportsbook. I'll tell you, I, I actually really do like LSU to at least win this game outright. I wouldn't bet it, but 
I'll just tell you, listen, I I know this isn't the game that the Brian Kelly era at LSU is going to be defined by. I do think if you watch this team closely, they do look like a little bit of a different football team since week one against Florida State. Against Mississippi State, they were much more fundamentally sound a few weeks ago, took care of business, tackling in space. They're running the ball really well. They had 633 yards of total offense against New Mexico last week. And so I don't think they're going to put up 600 yards against Auburn, but I do think that this is a team that knows who they are. They're establishing an identity. And I think we already know who Auburn is. They can't move the ball. They rely solely on the defense and eventually the defense runs out of gas. And so I do think LSU wins. Now I will say this is a historically low scoring game in my official bet. Fred picks. I did take the under a 45 and a half because this rivalry is one that traditionally always is super low scoring. You go back, even the year that Joe Burrow was at LSU, remember, it was actually Auburn that held the LSU offense with Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase to the lowest output of the season. This is a historically low-scoring rivalry, but I do like LSU to win this game. Let's move on to another game that I do want to kind of talk about a big-picture conversation. Then we'll take a break, and we'll kind of preview some of the other games, Michigan, Iowa, Ole Miss, Kentucky, And that is Arkansas, Alabama. Alabama is on the road going to Fayetteville. Alabama's a 17-point favorite in the Bedfred Sportsbook. And I'll just tell you this. This is the time of year where we start to learn about some teams that maybe we don't know a ton about. Now, I think with Arkansas, I do think that we know who they are, right? They've already played two SEC games. They played South Carolina early in the season at home. They played A&M on a neutral field last week in a game that they could have and maybe should have won. They played Cincinnati in the Ottawa Conference. I don't think that we know that much, all that much about Alabama. And I'll tell you, I do think it's been interesting. We've probably talked about it on this show over the last couple of days. I think it's fascinating that everybody is just quickly lumping Alabama in with Georgia and Ohio State, right? That was the conversation coming out of last week. Well, there is a clear top three. It's Georgia, Ohio State, and Alabama. I'm not saying that Alabama can't be in that class. What I'm just saying is, the bottom line is, what have they done to really prove it, right? Georgia crushed Oregon to open the season on a neutral field. Georgia crushed South Carolina at South Carolina. Ohio State took care of business against Notre Dame. They've gotten better every week. They destroyed Wisconsin at home. What has Alabama done? Destroyed a bad Utah State team, destroyed a bad Vandy team, destroyed a bad Louisiana Monroe team, and we all watched that Texas game. If Quinn Ewers does not get hurt, that's probably potentially a game that they lose. And so I bring it up because from the 30,000 foot view, I think we're going to learn a ton about Alabama and we're going to learn a ton about where this team is as a program. Not saying they win, not saying they lose, but as a program, we're going to learn a lot. And when I think about this game, it goes back to a couple of things. One, I think it actually goes back to last year. If you listen to this podcast last year, I was on this all year. Alabama fans were mad at me because I kept saying it. I said last year, I said, I don't think this is a vintage Alabama team. They are not beating teams the way that they normally do. They are not taking, I don't want to say they're not taking pride. They're just not beating teams the way that they used to. They used to walk into your building and want to embarrass you, want to destroy you. You go back to last year. What were the results? Two point win at Florida, a Tennessee game that they won big, but it was a one possession game going into the fourth quarter, 20 to 14 win over LSU. Um, and, and by the way, LSU had already fired Coach O at that point. A narrow win against Ar- Al- Auburn, excuse me, in the Iron Bowl in four overtimes. Obviously a loss at Texas A&M. And so I said it all last year. I thought it was going to change this year, but so far it hasn't. Highlighted, of course, by that Texas game that they survived by the skin of their teeth. And so what we're going to learn about Alabama this week, I think it's pretty straightforward. I think it's very straightforward, and I think it goes back to something we talked about earlier this week and a quote that Nick Saban has said. Nick Saban said after the Louisiana Monroe game, this is one of the great all-time quotes via Nick Saban. He said, at the end of the day, we need more, and these are his words, we need more hateful competitors. We need more hateful competitors. I can't think of a more accurate description of what Alabama needs to be than hateful competitors, okay? And for people who missed the segment on Wednesday, essentially what it comes down to is pretty straightforward. Nick Saban said that back in the day, the last couple of years, when they had their great teams, the best teams that he's ever had, it wasn't just about going to another team stadium and playing 11 on 11, you're 11 against our 11, let's see who's better. It was going into the other team stadium. And as I just said a minute ago, embarrassing people, 
destroying people, wanting to rip your soul out, wanting to see the fans walk to the aisles at the end of the third quarter because they knew the game was over. And Nick Saban said the last couple of years, there has been way too much casualness. And as in his own words, he said, I think most of the guys in that locker room are just totally content with winning the game, no matter how ugly it is and how close it is. And so I bring it up because this week we talked about it on Wednesday. You had Henry Toto, linebacker, uh, Will Anderson, All-American defensive end, Jordan Battle, All-American safety, all saying that they're finally starting to realize that hateful competitor mentality that they have to have. Well, it's one thing to say it after practice on a Wednesday. It's another thing to execute it when you go on the field on Saturday. And that's what I believe we are going to learn about Alabama in this Arkansas game. Again, I don't know what the final score will be. But the one thing about Arkansas that you cannot deny, Arkansas has a mentality. Arkansas has an edge. And as we've discussed many times, Arkansas has a brand right now. I give Sam Pittman so much credit. We talk about it. Former offensive line coach, all he does is he says, look, I'm lining the ball. I'm lining right up and we're coming after you on both sides of the football. Okay. We are going to run the ball right at you and we are going to attack your quarterback on the other end. And they're really good at both. Top 10 rushing offense in college football, even in the loss last week, 250-ish yards of rush offense, and they lead college football in sacks. Now, if Alabama comes out with the hateful anger, the hateful mentality, the hateful will that Nick Saban has talked about, I do think they win this game, and I think they potentially win big. Because while Arkansas is really good, there are two ways to beat them. You have to stop the run, and you have to be able to pass the ball. Alabama has a top five run defense in college football. This will be the best run defense Arkansas has seen all year. And Alabama can throw the ball with a quarterback named Bryce Young. But none of it matters if they don't come out with that mindset of, we are not only going to beat you, we are going to embarrass you. And it's one thing to do it against Louisiana Monroe. And it's one thing to do it against Vandy. And it's one thing to do it against Utah State. It's another thing on the road against a team that is not afraid of you and wants to physically beat the crap out of you. And so as far as this game's concerned, listen, I'll tell you, sometimes I have a great feel for a game. I'm going to make a pick and I feel good. And this is my pick. And this is where I'm going to go. Arkansas, Alabama, Alabama, a 17 point favorite in the Bedfred Sportsbook. I can't bet that game because I think if Bryce Young comes out, Bryce Young's not the problem, just to be clear. Bryce Young comes out throwing darts. I think it could be a long day for the Arkansas secondary if he gets rid of the ball quickly, uh, doesn't let those pass rushers get to him, including his former teammate, Drew Sanders, who now plays at Arkansas. I think it could get ugly. I think Alabama could win big and they could look like a vintage Bama team because I think they match up nicely. But if they come out, if they let Arkansas stay in the game, they let KJ Jefferson, Arkansas's quarterback, do KJ Jefferson things, I think Arkansas could pull the outright upset. So this is one I'm totally staying away from. I know who Arkansas is. I know their strengths. I know their weaknesses. I know they're going to be angry, especially after that loss to A&M last week. I know nothing about Alabama right now. This one is a complete stay away to me. Uh, Let's continue and let's kind of rip through the rest of the week five college football slate. A lot of really good games on the docket this weekend. Do want to start with another, how about this, another top 25 SEC game, Kentucky hosting Ole Miss. One, 11 a.m. Central time kickoff in the Grove. Greg Sankey, what are you doing, man? I know these games get scheduled two, three, four weeks in advance. But shame on you. This should be a night game. Let those kids in the Grove have fun. Anyway, neither here nor there. Uh, It's interesting because, you know, a couple things. One, the money from a betting perspective is coming in on Ole Miss. I think that's important. They opened as about a four, four and a half point favorite in the Betfred Sportsbook. It is now up to close to seven points as Ole Miss is favored. But then on top of that, what I think is interesting is this kind of speaks to what I said earlier in the show. I don't think we really know much about either of these teams. Now, like I said, there's teams like Arkansas. There's teams like Texas A&M. There's teams like Miami. There's teams, I would argue, like USC, like Ohio State. We know who those teams are and what they're about. I don't think we know very much about either of these teams. Kentucky, yes, they beat Florida. But as time has gone on, Florida has looked more and more as a team that is just struggling trying to figure it out. Uh, And outside of that, here's who Kentucky has beaten. Miami. Young Miami of Ohio, not Miami of Florida, I should say. Youngstown State and Northern Illinois. Not exactly a murderer's row. Neither is what Ole Miss has done, by the way. They took care of Troy, Central Arkansas, and Tulsa on top of Georgia Tech. 
who obviously is a terrible Power 5 team that just fired their coach a few weeks ago. So I bring it up to say that, uh, yeah, we're going to learn a lot about both teams. And I do think we're going to see something interesting in this game. Now, from the Kentucky perspective, I will tell you, I think they're going to try to do what they always do on the road, which is keep things low scoring. I told you this prior to the Florida game, um, and this is not a criticism of Mark Stoops, right? This is just a reality, is I think he learned two, three, four years ago, go on the road. It doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't matter how you play. Just go out and get the W. But he play, they, they play super conservative on the road. I expect that to continue this week, especially with the return of Chris Rodriguez, their star running back, who will be back in the lineup. But I went back and looked it up. And from a betting perspective, okay, and I know that this isn't the college football betting show. We did talk about this on the college football betting show as well. But Kentucky, the last five SEC road games that they've played, four have gone under the over-under win total. And I think for those of you who aren't betters, there is what we call an over-under win total, which is the Vegas projection, the Betfred Sportsbook projection on how many points it you know, will be scored in a game. The last five SEC road games, Kentucky has gone under that total four times. And then on top of that, the one time they went over was by one point at Mississippi State. So I think they want to keep it low scoring. I think they want to keep it close. I think that's how they want to play. And I'm curious how Ole Miss handles this game. And to be clear, this is one I, you know, I would not bet on the spread. I'd probably take the under. I did take the under, as a matter of fact, of 54. But with Ole Miss, you know, what's interesting about Ole Miss, and again, I talked about it on the college football betting show, but if you look at this game, you know, Ole Miss, I think we think of Lane Kiffin and he's super, you know, fast paced, you know, move the ball a million plays, a million miles an hour, throw the ball all over the field. This year, they're really running the ball at a really high clip. As a matter of fact, they have almost twice as many rush attempts this year, 194 as pass attempts, 104. And so I think Lane Kiffin, young team, a lot of new pieces. Zach Evans is a star. And they have kind of Jackson Dart, right? The transfer from USC. He's a young dude that hasn't played a lot of college football. Now, I know this game is in the Grove. It's in Oxford. It's going to be uh, a home game. I expect both teams to kind of keep it close to the vest. Uh, I expect a low-scoring game. I would probably pick Ole Miss. I do think it's close. As I said, my Betfred Sportsbook pick would be the under of 54. I actually like that a lot. I think we see a score of something like, you know, 24 to... 21 or something of that nature. I don't think Ole Miss just moves the ball up and down the field on this Kentucky team, but I do like the under in this game. I do think it's going to be close. I do think it's going to be low scoring. Mark Stoops wants to keep it low scoring and keep the ball in his possession on the road. That's what I expect to have happened in Oxford. Let's go to the Saturday night slate. So we mentioned Auburn LSU will be playing on Saturday night. So will NC State and Clemson. And it's funny, this is one the money has been kind of all over the place. Early in the week, uh, Clemson was a seven-point favorite. Some money came in on NC State. It went down to six and a half points, then back up to seven and a half points. And I think this is one of those games where there's maybe a little bit of an overreaction to last week with Clemson. They barely hold on, barely survive against Wake Forest. And I think the inclination is, oh, they're just not that good. As I told you on Monday show, I actually think it's probably the exact opposite. I think Clemson, it was almost the best case scenario. Now, you never want to give up as many points as they did, 45 points in in an overtime game. But on the one hand, that was the best offense they'll see all year. You get the win. And more importantly, and I do think this is important, they went, that was probably the best offense that they will see all season long in Wake Forest. And so if you're Dabo Sweeney, I think that's one where you just sit there and say, you know what, we actually just played a really good team. And rather than stressing about all the details, rather than stressing out about the fact that it was a close, low scoring game, I think you're just happy that you played a top 25 team on the road that's really explosive offensively and you got the win. And to take it a step further, by the way, not only did you get the win, not only did you get the win, you did it in a way that everybody, including Aaron Torres, told you that you could not. Because what was the story out of last week? It was the best game that DJ Uyilaganlele has played all of his entire career. This was a guy that we said for years wasn't good enough, couldn't get the job done, wasn't accurate enough. Well, he threw for 371 yards and five touchdowns. And so again, it's almost the best case scenario. The analogy I'll use, it's almost like the exact opposite of the USC game last week. Everybody told us that USC couldn't win if it was close, low scoring, defensive. Well, USC did. Clemson, we were told, 
can't win if it's cl- if it's a high scoring game, if the defense can't get stops, if the offense has to make plays. The offense was awesome down the stretch. DJ made plays down the stretch. Now, I don't think he's a finished product. I don't think he's Bryce Young. I don't think he's CJ Stroud. But is he good enough to win a lot of games this season, potentially get back to an ACC championship, potentially get back to a playoff? I think so. I think we're going to learn this week. Now, from the NC State perspective, I'll say this. They're a top 10 team in the country. I'm not totally sold that they're that they're deserving of that top 10 stature. Keep in mind, the wins, I mean, they needed a, a special teams mishaps from East Carolina to beat East Carolina in week one. Texas Tech in, in the second, uh, second marquee game of their season, they played Charleston Southern FCS team, who cares? Second game of the year against Texas Tech, they were outgained at home by Texas Tech. And if it wasn't for a bunch of turnovers by Texas Tech, Texas Tech probably wins that game. Yes, I just said Texas Tech 37 times in one sentence. And then finally, last week against UConn, listen, you're going to make fun of me. UConn's really bad. UConn is beat up. You know UConn's down their top quarterback, top two running backs, top three wide receivers? NC State beat them 41 to 10. That should have probably been like a 60 to nothing game if you're a top 10 team in the country. And so I look at NC State. Their star quarterback, Devin Leary, his numbers are down this year. Completion percentage is down. Touchdown rate is down relative to last year. Yards per completion is down. I'm just telling you, I think this is a game where NC State goes on the road. Clemson, everybody doubts them. Oh, they're not as good as they were. This feels like a game where Clemson goes out. Clemson gets the victory. Clemson dominates in dominant fashion. I'm predicting a Clemson blowout in this game. Uh, I don't know, 35 to 7 or something like that. The odds in the Betfred Sportsbook, Clemson a seven-point favorite. How about them Tigers? Really quick, I just dropped my pen. I'm going to pick it up. Give me one second. All right, I'm back. Good to be back. Good to be back. Okay, last game I want to get to. So I told you off the top, right? What did I say? I said we have the Betfred Sportsbook boost this week. It is Iowa plus 11 at home against Michigan. And I know a lot of you say, there's no way I'm going to bet Iowa. Zero percent chance I'm going to bet Iowa. Let me talk some sense into you. Let me explain why I think it's the best bet on the board, okay? So first of all, think about how Michigan wants to play this game. And think about what happened last week. J.J. McCarthy, he's officially the starter. Cade McNamara's hurt. It's his situation. What happened? He doesn't play all that well. He's a little erratic, a little loose with the football, a little bit, you know, too crazy. And it was really the run game that bailed Michigan out last week against Iowa. And so fast forward to this week, Iowa doesn't do a lot of things well. They stopped the run, top 10 run defense. And I do think it is worth noting, when Iowa wins at a high level, it's because they're turning you over and making you make mistakes. And so when I look at this game, here's what I see. I see a Michigan team that's walking into a hornet's nest. I see a Michigan team that's going to play a tough physical team on defense that doesn't make mistakes. I think Michigan is going to have to have J.J. McCarthy make plays for them. And I think J.J. McCarthy might make some mistakes that a young quarterback in his first career road start might. And so that is why it is my official uh, Betfred uh, Betfred boost, excuse me, plus 11 on the road. I like Iowa at home as a, uh, so I I should say on the road, uh, Michigan is on the road. Iowa at home, an 11 point favorite. And by the way, I'll say this as well. History is on your side if you take Michigan in this one. So I went back and looked it up, and Michigan and Iowa don't play every year, so I don't want to make this a they play at Iowa every other year type deal. But I looked it up, and this blew me away. The last five times that Michigan has played at Iowa, Donut, 0-5 in their last five games at Iowa, straight up. Not even against the spread, straight up. On top of that, the last time they won at Iowa, 2005. Some of the freshmen on this team were basically being born at that point babies last time that michigan won by double figures at iowa remember they're an 11 point favorite 1994 and so i look at this game history tells us every time these teams play uh, play at kinnick stadium in iowa it's close it's low scoring it's competitive remember 2016 michigan entered november undefeated it was year two of the jim harbaugh era we thought they were going to the playoff. It was the game where they they had the they were like this close to convert to stopping a fourth down and beating Ohio State. That year they went to Kinnick on a Saturday night and lost outright. I don't know if they lose outright. 
I do believe that they get the that I do believe that Iowa covers the 11. I'm telling you that is my bet Fred boost of the week. Really quickly, no strong opinions on most of the other games. You know, really interesting slate. Uh, Oklahoma going on the road after that loss last week. They play TCU. Probably stay away from that one for sure. Uh, I think Oklahoma wins. Oklahoma bounces back. I have no idea what to make of it. No idea what to make of Wake Forest versus Florida State. I think there's a legitimate chance that Florida State might just be like really good. I think that's a real possibility. Um, and Florida State might be kind of underrated. I don't know how they're only ranked number 23 after they beat LSU earlier this year. Um, but I like Florida State at home against Wake Forest. Oklahoma State, Baylor. I think Oklahoma State's probably the, the right team to bet there. Um, but those are my picks. You know, my, my favorite bets in terms of this weekend, my favorite bets, I told you, my boosted bet in the Betfred Sportsbook, as of Friday morning, it will be available. It is Iowa plus 11. I also like the under in the Kentucky Ole Miss game. I would also bet the under in the Auburn LSU game, which, as I said, historically is a close game. And I do want to wrap with what has quickly become, hate to brag, America's favorite podcast segment where Aaron was right, where Aaron was wrong. Concept of the segment, it is pretty straightforward. Did steal it from my buddy Colin Cowherd. Don't want anybody saying, oh, Torres, you took that from Cowherd. Yeah, I know I did. I love Colin. He's been great to me through my career. Uh, but I bring it up to say that he does where Colin was right, where Colin was wrong. I do where Aaron was right, where Aaron was wrong. And to be honest, it's just a fun way to wrap the week, right? Over the course of a week, a month, a year, two years, five years, 10 years, whatever. I like to put out a lot of sports opinions and I get a lot of stuff right. And when I get stuff right, I like to tell you about it. Torres told you this. You should have listened to Torres. Why didn't you listen to Torres? On and on. I never shut up. Just ask my wife. I never shut up. But at the same time, I get a lot of stuff wrong too. And I got to own it and I got to be held accountable for it. So that is why we do where Aaron was right, where Aaron was wrong. Fun way to wrap every single Friday show, giving you my best takes of the week, month, year and giving you my worst ones as well, where Aaron was right. So let's start with the conversation we had to lead the show. Well, not technically lead the show, but Alabama. And I said all of last year, I said, there's something not right with this team. There's something not right with this program. I'm not saying they're falling apart. I'm not saying Rome is collapsing under Mount Vesuvius. What I am saying, though, is that if you watched Alabama for all those years, they were dominant, they were overwhelming. They were a team that, as we said, they didn't just want to go into your stadium and beat you. They wanted to rip your heart out. And I started to notice late last year, I said, this team just does not have that edge. And I, I'll be honest, at the time I played it up to youth, uh, inexperience, all that good stuff. But finally, Nick Saban agreed with me. And finally, Nick Saban had enough a few weeks ago. And he said, we need more hateful competitors. That's what I've been saying for a year and a half. It's not that they don't have the talent. It's not that the program is crumbling. And oh, by the way, even in a quote unquote down year last year, they still won the SEC, still went to the college football playoffs, still played for a national title, but they haven't been the same team and they haven't played with the same edge. As we told you to lead the show, I really do think this is an important game for Alabama. It's not just about beating Arkansas. And I think they can get upset by the way, but if you want to prove that you're Georgia, that you're Ohio State, that you are in the upper echelon, the highest levels of college football still, you got to go out and punk somebody some, at some point, right? Georgia comes out and takes people's lunch money. Ohio State came out and took Wisconsin's lunch money last week. Alabama, I don't care about you, Ella Monroe. I don't care about Vandy. Beat somebody that matters. Beat their brains in. Show us that you are who we thought you were, where Aaron was right. I've been telling you for a year and a half, this isn't vintage Bama. We'll see if it comes to play on Saturday where Aaron was wrong. So I'll be honest. I remember where I was the day that I found out that Josh Heupel was named the next Tennessee head football coach. It was early in the morning. I want to say it was about 6, 6.30 Pacific, 9, 9.30 Eastern time. And when I heard the hire, I said, Josh Heupel. Like I had watched him at Central Florida, but when Tennessee's AD came from Central Florida, hires a search firm only to hire the head coach that he just had at Central Florida, I said, this isn't the best guy for the job. This is just plain old nepotism. Ah, uh, yeah, I think I was wrong on that one. Josh Heupel has not only been awesome, he has exceeded all logical, all logical expectations, right? You go back to last year, seven and five, seven and six when you include the bowl game, but you go back and look at some of the games that Tennessee played. Hennon Hooker did not start against Pitt. If he starts that game, they might win. 
Hendon Hooker did not finish the game against Ole Miss. If he finishes that game, they might win. And Tennessee was closer to probably an 8-4, and 9-3 and three regular season team last year than they were to a team that finished 7-5. and five. And then he included the bowl game that they easily could have won as well. Fast forward to this year, the momentum has only picked up. They're 4-0. They beat Florida. They were in complete control of that game. I got to tell you, man, this program is so far ahead of schedule, I cannot even explain. Credit to Josh Heupel. I did not really get the hire. I thought it was nepotism bringing your buddy from your old job. No, 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 no. Josh Heupel is a great coach. This offense is fun to watch. And Tennessee is rolling into their bye week, where Aaron was right. So listen, I'll tell you, I've never understood the hate for PJ Fleck. I've ne- dating back to the West Western Michigan days, and I'll be honest. Look, part of it is I work in the media. I have access to some people, and so I've had a chance to talk to PJ Fleck once or twice. I interviewed him when he was at FoxSports.com, and I'll be honest. Yeah, the the cliches and the row the boat and the you know you call him up on the phone. You say, "How are you doing, Coach?" He says, "I'm doing elite. Thank you for asking." I get that it's a little much if you're not a Minnesota guy, if you're not a PJ Fleck guy. But all this guy does is not only win, but win at the highest level wherever he goes. Remember, 13-0 his final season at Western Michigan until he lost in the Cotton Bowl to Wisconsin. Comes to Minnesota. By year three, they're 11-2. COVID year. Last year, they go 9-4. They're 4-0 this weekend going into the Purdue game. And I'm just telling you, look at the stats. They speak for themselves over his last three non-COVID years. 24-6, 80% 24 and 6, 80% win percentage in the toughest Big Ten maybe in my lifetime. I'm not saying the Big Ten is the SEC right now, but you look at the money committed at these schools, the financial resources available. Purdue is playing better than they ever have. Iowa wins all the time. Wisconsin's really good. Uh, Illinois is tough with Brett Bielema, let alone everybody in the East. James Franklin, Jim Harbaugh, um, you know, whoever, Ryan Day, on and on and on and on and on. I give P.J. Fleck credit. Minnesota is 4-0. I don't understand the hate. This guy is doing things at Minnesota that nobody should be able to do. I don't know how realistic it is to get him out of there with his current contract, but I can only imagine if the Ohio State job one day opens, Ryan Day goes to the NFL. Uh, If Michigan opens, if Penn State opens, this is a guy you should call. This guy could win anywhere. Don't know that he makes sense at like Auburn. Don't think Nebraska is a significantly better job than Minnesota, but I cannot even imagine what this guy could do at a blue blood type job. Give PJ Fleck credit where Aaron was wrong. So look, I was really critical of DJ Uyangalale uh, over the course of this summer. I said, he's not the guy. And after the Georgia tech game, I actually went so far as to say he is not the guy and you need to bench him, bring in the freshman Kate Klubnik. Well, for at least one Saturday, I was dead wrong. He was awesome in the Clemson-Wake Forest game, five touchdowns, 371 yards, and he was really the reason that they won that game. Defense lets him down, offense makes plays, and what I would say about DJ is, look, he is a work in progress. He is not there yet. He is not a finished product. But when I see that kid, I see a kid that is getting better every week. I see a kid that has evolved this year. I don't know. We're going to learn a lot in this NC State game, right? Because NC State is a good defensive team. And I think NC State will give Minnesota, Minnesota will give Clemson problems if DJ does not come to play. But as I tell you all the time, the show is tonight. I have to give credit where it's due. And I was dead wrong on DJ Uyangalala. Where Aaron was right. Let's go to the NFL, where I've always liked Jalen Hurts. And part of it is I just like the Jalen Hurts story, right? Gets benched in a title game, could easily transfer comes back the next year, serves as a backup to Tua. And then, oh, by the way, uh, Tua gets hurt in the SEC title game. Jalen Hurts leads them to victory in the SEC title game against Georgia, the same team that he was benched against, ultimately does transfer that final year to Oklahoma. But when people said he's not an NFL quarterback, I said, why? Heisman finalist at Oklahoma, got Oklahoma to the college football playoff. People forget his freshman year at Alabama when Lane Kiffin was his play caller. He was the SEC Offensive Player of the Year. Goes to the NFL. No, he's not a starter. No, he's a backup. Eventually beats out Carson Wentz. And now, as I record here, Philadelphia, the only undefeated team in the NFC, atop the NFC East standings. 
So happy for this kid. Seems like a great guy. Seems like he's about all the right things. I know when he got to Alabama, those kids loved him. When he got to Oklahoma, those kids loved him. And I cannot, I, I could not be more excited for a kid to have success. Never understood why people didn't think that Jalen Hurts could win in the NFL. Where Aaron was wrong. Let's go to college basketball. And, and, and you know, again, let's call a spade a spade here. We talked about the Memphis situation earlier this week. But I'll be honest, while I am happy that Memphis didn't get the book thrown at them for something that Penny Hardaway did while he was a high school coach, uh, I did say that playing James Wiseman was going to cost him. Eh, it didn't really end up costing him. Now, it did end up costing him James Wiseman because he eventually got suspended and left. But I thought Penny Hardaway could potentially lose his job for playing James Wiseman when he was ineligible. Well, not only did Penny Hardaway not lose his job, he wasn't suspended and Memphis did not get a postseason ban. Now, what I would say, bottom line, looked into this a little bit, it's simple, good lawyering, okay? So if you go and kind of read the reports and the details, the lawyers basically claim that Penny Hardaway somehow did not know that James Wiseman was ineligible when he played him. That's a bunch of hogwash, but I'll tell you what, this is why you pay good money for good lawyers. So I was dead wrong. I thought Memphis was going to have the book thrown at him. They did not. Penny Hardaway survives. Now we'll see what kind of team he's got. DeAndre Williams, Kendrick Davis, a very interesting team going into this year. I should mention, by the way, we will kind of ramp up our college hoops coverage here over the next couple of weeks on the Aaron Torres pod, have some exciting college hoops stuff to get with with you. Where Aaron was right. So let's go back to Tennessee. I talked about Josh Heupel. When Hendon Hooker transferred in, I said, that guy's really good. I had seen him a couple of times at Virginia Tech. I'd be lying if I said I, I, I've, I've broken down a ton of Virginia Tech film. but when he was at Virginia Tech, I said, this guy's a baller. This guy's a gamer. Well, turns out I was dead right. So far this season, 72% completion percentage, eight touchdowns, no interceptions. I think he's very much in the Heisman Trophy conversation. Listen, Tennessee's toughest games are still ahead. They go to LSU next week. They have Alabama, obviously, the third weekend in October. Uh, and, of course, they have Georgia later in the year as well as Kentucky. Not saying the road is easy. Not saying they're going undefeated. Not saying they're going to the playoff. But Hendon Hooker is the kind of guy. I'm going to tell you, every year, these Heisman candidates come out of nowhere to end up in the Heisman conversation. Doesn't Hendon Hooker feel like that guy this year? Kind of feels like it to me, putting up great stats. If Tennessee elevates, if Tennessee's 10-2, and two, if Tennessee pulls off an upset against an Alabama, we could be talking about Hendon Hooker going to New York to win the Heisman Trophy. Not saying it happens. C.J. Stroud's still in the mix. Bryce Young is still in the mix. But guys come out of nowhere every single year. Hendon Hooker could be that guy. Finally, where Aaron was wrong, and I'm going to have to keep taking L's on this one. It looks like DJ Wagner, number one recruit in America, is going to the University of Kentucky. And we've talked about this. I, like everybody else in the media, when his grandfather got hired at Louisville, I got swept up in the idea that he was going to Louisville. Fast forward, we got the announcement from Travis Branham, or the report, I should say, that DJ Wagner will visit Kentucky for a second time for Big Blue Madness on October 14th and that he will not visit Louisville. I think it's going to be Kentucky. I think it'll probably happen pretty soon. I was dead wrong on that. All right. I think that's it for this episode of the Air Tour Sports Podcast. Before we get out of here, I want to make sure you do a few things. One, make sure you're subscribed on Apple. Make sure you're subscribed on Spotify. If you want to leave a rating and review, that would be great. We've, have, we've had a few of them over the last couple of weeks. We appreciate your support. Uh, also, make sure to subscribe on YouTube. New episodes go up every morning at 6 a.m. You can watch on YouTube just like you can watch, just like you can listen uh, on Apple or Spotify. Make sure to rate and review the show. As I said, leave a rating and uh, leave a nice little comment. And that's really it. Long week, fun week, five episodes. We crushed it. We killed it. Did AT do it again or did AT do it again? Thank you to our partners at the Betfred Sportsbook. Again, the AT Boost, Iowa plus 11 at home. Take, it, take advantage of it. It will be up in the Betfred Sportsbook on Friday. And also, thank you to Betfred for their incredible work with us. And also, by the way, thank you to Bracket Fanatics. Make sure you pick, make your week four picks at Bracket Fanatics. That is all for today's show. I am drained, fun week, exhausting week, ready to get to Saturday. That is all for today's show. Shout out to Torrent Craig. Shout out to Rachel, who hates my voice. Shout out to JJ Reddick, you F head on Block Me. I'll be back on Monday. You know we're going to have a lot to talk about on the Aaron Torres Sports Podcast.